We're going to take just a few minutes today. We're going to talk about Pentecost because this is Pentecost Sunday. And the things that are so extravagantly wonderful about Pentecost, they, it has been lost in the historical uh, records almost. Um, there is a poem that they read during Pentecost. This poem is very, <laughs> it's just almost impossible to get a hold of a copy of it. They, they read this poem faithfully in uh, the Jewish uh, culture. They read it on Pentecost Sunday, or not, not really Sunday. It's the, Pentecost is a Sabbath to them, so it is a Sabbath. Uh, but it's, it's just quite, quite different. In summary, the poem begins with the greatness of God which exceeds all ability to describe to describe it. Verses 1 through 14 talks about the myriads of various kinds of angels created by him and attending to God. The various angels praise God according to their categories. Some praise him unceasingly. Some at reoccurring times. Some only once. Some of those angels praise him once kind of powerful praise that must be and then the nations of the earth seek to acquire Israel to to uh, add to their their own greatness and uh, it is and it, the entire poem is 90 verses long the first 44 verses of the Adamic are arranged as a double alphabetic acrostic Two lines for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So every first two lines of every one is another, uh, um, you know, it's a, like a double, like always God is good and, and um, another sentence that begins with the letter A, I can't think. But the... Uh, the language of the poem is Arama Aramaic, and it's a very terse and difficult Aramaic, or even it's never intelligible. Some prayer books, especially those intended for use in Israel, provide a running translation of the new archaic uh, Aramaic, Aramaic into Hebrew. They try to change it. It's just... It's just a poem. They, they read, they study, they analyze it, and yet they can't even say it. You know, there's the unmentionable name of God. Uh, and so they don't even write the word G-O-D. They, they, G-D. Lord is L-R-D. Lord. They don't write it. They don't write that name. They, they reverence the name of God in a, in a very unusual way. And this time of Pentecost, like Annette said before, they actually stay up all night and read the Torah. Now, what is the Torah? Do you know what the Torah is? Huh? The first five books. They read. I, I knew that the Jewish people read the first five books of the Bible every year. I didn't know when they did it. But it is on the last day, the, the night before the 50th day after Passover. Now, bear in mind, they had this Passover meal, and then the next morning, the shofar. You got it, Ricky? The shofar blew. So imagine waiting in the morning till you hear the shofar. And as soon as the shofar blew, go ahead, blow it. Yeah, you can keep trying. Go ahead. You'll get it. When they heard that all throughout their camps, all throughout their houses, immediately they walk out the front door knowing they're never coming back. And when Jesus returns, there's going to be the sounding of the trumpet. Well, they didn't have a trumpet. 
So, so far as I know, they only had a shofar. And you're going to hear the sound. Uh, maybe it will be played on a longer shofar. It may be played a little more elegantly. But that was good. He did very good. <laughs> Sometimes when you try to get somebody to play those little shofars and on cue, it's very difficult. They spit, they sputter. But he got it. He got her done. Amen. But I wanted you to hear the shofar is going to be played. And the moment that it's played, you're getting out of here because the trump of God will sound. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him. I just heard uh, Stephen and Edwin, these, these guys, they, they find some funny stuff on the internet. And they have this, they, they sent this to me yesterday, I think it was yesterday. This girl is trying to teach that the Lord is definitely coming back on September the 23rd, 2015. It's always been set in concrete that that's when he's returning. Well, I, I, I sort of tell you this truth. That's one day for sure he's not coming. Because if too many people are thinking he's coming on that day, he probably will not come on that day. But just in case, I say it's good to be ready. Can you, can you be ready on that day? But you better be ready the day before. <laughs> because if they don't have the calendar straight over the last 4,000 years, you're liable to get the wrong date and miss him entirely. They say that the guys that were commandeered those airplanes and flew them into the to the uh, trade World Trade Center buildings. They say those guys spent the night before uh, carousing in topless bars, drinking and getting drunk, and going out with as many girls as they could. Now, my question is, uh, is that what you're supposed to do just before you get 72 virgins? I mean, because they were promised that if they commit suicide in the name of Allah, they're going to get 72 virgins. So uh, they were trying to, uh, you know, get a jump start on those 72 virgins, I reckon. I don't, I don't know if they were looking for virgins or not in those bars. But the point is that you need to be ready because tomorrow you're going to fly your plane into the World Trade Center building. I don't know about you, if that was what I had to do the next day, I sure would, I mean, I would be sweating bullets. I mean, I don't know. If you told me tomorrow we're going to jump out of a plane and we're going to parachute down to the ground, trust me, I wouldn't sleep very much that night because the event would be just, it would be overwhelming. But can you imagine getting ready to commit the, uh, the crime of the century and uh and that's what they have documented records. Of, that's where they were. They were using credit cards, uh, illegal credit cards or whatever they were doing. But they were going to have a great old time before they killed themselves. So the world is fast, running at a fast breakneck pace to destroy themselves. But on the day of Pentecost, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Throw it up there, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. That's the text today. Because you've got to understand that they were not just up there praying all the time. They had to count the Omer. Omer. O-M-E-R. Omer. And what's the Omer? It's a measure. It's a handful of barley. And then on the day of Pentecost, on the beginning of Pentecost, they, they grabbed the first fruits of the barley field, uh, of the barley first and then the wheat. Well, my wife says it's the wheat and the barley. It's one or the other or maybe both. But at the end of the 50 days, now, now watch this, some harvest was first and they grabbed that and they waved it before the Lord. The barley. I, I got it right. I'm right again. Oh, hallelujah. We're going to celebrate. We've got cake in the back to celebrate with today. 
this is our anniversary service here. And 37 years we've been here, counting the Omer. <laughs> I hope we don't have to wait till the 50th year before there's a big breakthrough. But the, we have this, these, these people were in the upper room. It started with more than 120, guarantee you. But at the end, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord. So they had Hondas back then. Uh, and the Honda was in one place. No, they were all in one accord. And I've been told, I was told, I heard sermons preached all my life that when God finally got them into one mind and one accord, then he could send the Holy Spirit. That's wrong. God was not waiting for them to get in one mind and in one Honda, I mean one accord. He was waiting for the day of Pentecost to fully come. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, when the sun had risen, when, when it's the, the, the evening and the morning was the first day. So the day of Pentecost began at 6 o'clock the evening before. But at 9 o'clock in the morning, the Holy Spirit came because the day of Pentecost was in full swing. It was going to be ending soon. At 6 o'clock that afternoon, the day of Pentecost would be over. Now, something happened to start this, this uh, celebration, you know, and it was the Passover that started it. They had no celebration when they were in, in Egyptian bondage. They had no Passover celebration for 400 years. God told Abraham, your people are going to go into Egyptian bondage for 400 years, into a strange place for 400 years. But I'm going to bring them out with great substance. So it was the end of the 400 years that the Jewish people ate the Passover meal. And the Passover meal is exactly what we had here today. It's the, it was the original type. And that's why we let children partake of the Passover meal. Because in the origin of the Passover meal, the children had to go around the house and take a little feather and a little uh, dustpan and gather up all the leavened bread. They had to get rid of all the leavened bread. So there they were. Now, when the, when the Jewish people ate that Passover, they had no idea what they were doing. They did not know it was a type of the crucifixion of Christ. They did it in obedience. That's very important, folks. They were told, you've got to kill a lamb, not a ram. Every family killed a lamb. Every family had to get dip. Uh, they had to get some hyssop, which was, uh, they didn't have paintbrushes in those days. And that, that hyssop would absorb whatever you put it into. They had to get hyssop, put it in the blood, and put it on top of the door and on both sides of the doorpost. And the blood dropped down from the center and the blood ran down from the sides. And every home that had that blood on their doorpost, the death angel passed over them. In the, in the, the original Passover, if you, if you didn't have the blood, the angel killed your firstborn son. And so if you had the blood on your doorpost, you were saying, we're in it. We're with it. We're part of it. We're, we are one of those getting ready to leave. We're obedient to what God has told Moses to tell us to do. And it was through that obedience that brought that night in their homes when they ate the Passover meal, when they remembered how they were in bondage, bondage in Egypt, when they remembered, when they ate the bitter herbs and remembered that they had, been, had a bitter life there. It had not been a, a life of honey and roses. 
It, it had been a very hard life. It, they had come there because they had, ran, they had run out of food where they used to live. And Moses was their savior, as it were, but he was different from the other people that lived in the palace because Pharaoh's children didn't look like Moses. And there were always people wondering, why does Moses look the way he does? But it was kept a secret that he had been taken from the bulrushes, that he was one of those Hebrew kids. And they tried their best to raise him so that he wouldn't have any Hebrew influence, but they made a mistake. The little girl that ran along watching the little basket in the water was told to run along there, and when if Pharaoh's daughter had picked the baby up and killed it, the, that act, that play would have been over. But she picks it up, and she says, oh my, 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 what do I have here? And she sees a little Hebrew girl over there, and she thinks, they're our slaves. Hello? And I don't have any milk, but I'm going to claim this is my baby. Hey, little girl, come here a minute. And timidly, little, his sister Miriam walks up to Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter says, do you know any Hebrew woman that has a baby that I can hire her to feed this little baby? And she says, oh, what a coincidence. I know exactly the woman. And there was Moses' mother raising him as a little child, knowing she only had three years to give input to this baby. And she sang him the songs of Zion. Somebody shout amen. She sang him the lullabies of the Hebrews. Pharaoh's daughter in her deluded mind must have overheard her talking to that little baby singing to that little baby, not realizing that she was imparting to that baby the history of the Israel pe Israeli people, the history of the Jewish people. <clears throat> he grew up, and that mother probably had access. If not, at least Miriam was slick enough to keep access. And every now and then they would get to Moses' side and no doubt tell him, you have a call on your life. And Pharaoh was saying, one day you're going to be a god. And Miriam was saying to little Moses, one day you're going to know God. And so with this he grew up in all of this time that passed. And then he finds himself standing up to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh was saying, just, why don't you just go out there, just take all your men out there and worship. Leave your kids and your wives behind. No, you got to let them all go. And the final blow came when Moses raised his hand before Pharaoh and said, the death angel is coming. Then he sent word throughout all his people that if the blood is on your house, the death angel will pass over. And today, the word is going out. If the blood is on your heart, he will not pass over. You're getting out of here. You're going to be taken away. Ha ha. And so we have this tremendous story. And so they leave and they go and their backs against the, the Red Sea. And they're looking at Pharaoh coming down on them because Pharaoh realizes these crazy Egyptians just gave these Hebrew people everything we got. And he wants to get it back. He was finished with the slaves, but he wanted the gold back probably. This is my scenario. And so he, breathing down upon them, held back by the pillar of fire. And the cloud can't get through it. Moses stretches his hand over the Red Sea and it opens up. 
and they walk across on dry ground. And then they go 37 more days, 45 days into the wilderness. And they come to a place and it just so happens on the 50th day after Passover, actually the 47th day after Passover, they're standing there at Mount Sinai. And God says, Moses, come up here. And he goes up. He comes down with two tablets. I got the Ten Commandments. And the people go wild. He goes back up again. He comes down. And right in that setting, 3,000 people die. Not 3,500. Not 4,500. 3,000 die. 3,000 died at Mount Sinai. around 50 days after Passover. And then we find the book of Deuteronomy is written. And another book is written. And it says you're supposed to have a feast 50 days after Passover. And they do that for a long time. For hundreds and hundreds of years they do this thing. Not knowing what they're doing not having an inkling of what they're doing. And I wish to read to you a scripture today that I think will impact your life. And it's the bottom line of what I want to share with you today. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Now you should be able to remember this. 31, 31. 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Look at it. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Now, he, he made a covenant with them. When did he make the covenant with them? When did God make the covenant with the children of Israel? Fifty days after Passover. I've never seen this before. And Ed gets all excited about Pentecost. It's Pentecost. It's Pentecost. I said, I've preached Pentecost Sunday so many times. I want to tell people that they can receive the Holy Spirit. And then she starts bringing out all these details. She says, 3,000 people were killed on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. And then she read this. She said to me, and 3,000 people were saved after Jesus was the Passover. 3,000 die in the beginning. 3,000 were made alive. The first covenant was given. The covenant of death. The covenant where you cannot ever attain to it. And the second covenant was made on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, that's when the second covenant was implemented. That is the birthday of the church of the living God. That is the moment that God did something that was different from what had been done before because the old covenant was not based on God's Son's blood, but the old covenant you're looking at it. The Ten Commandments were given 50 days after Passover. The Old Covenant was a covenant that says you can't keep it. Don't even try. The Old Covenant was a covenant of death. You had to kill 
lambs. You had to kill bulls. You had to kill goats. You had to kill something to enter into this old covenant. But the new covenant was made on better promises. And so Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Verse 33 says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts. And, and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Look at Jeremiah 31, 34 and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The first Passover... was birthed in death. The law came to kill us. But Jesus came to give us life. The first covenant was a covenant where 3,000 died. The second covenant was the covenant when he implemented it. When Adam and Eve sinned, God took his spirit out from the earth. The day they ate of it, they died. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And the law, when it was given, showed us we are far from God. It was a schoolmaster. And not, an, not a pleasant learning experience. The schoolmaster had a rod. If you fell asleep in class, he popped you on your head with it. The law was birthed in death, always death, always the shedding of blood, trying to cover. They can't cleanse sin, so we have to cover it and cover it and cover it, they did. But Jeremiah 33, 30, 31, 31 says, a little bit further down, he says, I'll teach them, they will teach Every man no more his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, You need to know the Lord, for they shall all know the Lord. Now let me share with you that same verse in the book of Hebrews. Because in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 7, it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second covenant. For the finding fault of them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's quoting from Jeremiah 31, 31. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not with my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, saith the Lord, in those days. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. All direct quotes. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, You need to know the Lord. They won't teach that anymore. For all shall know him, shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant he hath made. The first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth and is ready to vanish away. The first was an old covenant. It's, it's, it's going to vanish away. Now, what happens, the people are up in the upper room. They've been told, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit 
only came unto men. The word of the Lord came unto the prophets. The power of God overshadowed those people of the Old Testament. But the power of God was not in them. They were not filled with the Holy Spirit. They could not be filled with the Holy Spirit because the blood of Jesus had not been given. But when the blood of Jesus came, the shedding of the blood of bulls and of goats were no more. But the blood of Jesus was able to wash them inside. How many understand that? Washed inside to where God could now come and live in them. So on the day of Pentecost, that is when the church was born. That is when God said, I'll write in their hearts my law. I believe that when the Holy Spirit came, something happened to the entire human race. I believe it happened to the people of America, the Indians. I believe it happened to the Peruvians. I believe when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost and died, that the earth shook. And I believe on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came back to this world in a manner and in a way that, had, that he had not had access to for thousands of years. I believe that every single person on this planet has a knowledge of right and wrong that they did not have before in the Old Testament. I believe in the Old Testament, they walked around. If they wanted to cut somebody's head off, they cut their head off. Society told them what was right. Society told them what was wrong. And that's what the world is trying to put us back under today. Keep God out of it. But even when people pass those laws that say it's okay for two men to get married, something inside of every person has to cry out and say, something's wrong with this. And no sooner had they made this clear in a certain state than two people came to another state. Listen to this carefully. There was a man that had a, a stepson. It was not technically his son. And they fell in love. The stepfather fell in love with his stepson. And they were living as husband and wife in another state. And they moved to this other state where it was not acceptable that way. And so now, it's going to go all the way up through the Supreme Court again. Why can't I marry my son? And if I can marry my son, then why can't these five women marry me? So polygamy now is being challenged in Utah as it's never been challenged before. And why can't two men marry one woman? When you take the definition of marriage off, you have pandemonium in your society. And you do it legally. But legally doesn't make it morally right. And today I'm not talking about morals. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments of God written, the commandments of God written in people's hearts. And when the day of Pentecost fully came, the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the house where they were sitting. God came down, cloven tongues of fire was lit, lit, set upon each one of them. And they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they all began to speak with other tongues as God gave, as the Holy Spirit gave the utterance. And when that happened, my friend, the Holy Spirit was unleashed on the earth. And from that moment, the Holy Spirit hovers over every single person that's known as a person. If you're not a cat or a dog, the Holy Spirit has been hovering over you. And there is somewhere within you something that says what is right and what is wrong. Yes, you can sear your conscience with a hot iron. Yes, you can absolutely override your conscience. But I'm not talking about your conscience. I'm talking about something far deeper than your conscience. I'm talking about within the depths of your heart. I can take you to a village in Papua New Guinea. 
I can take you to a village that had never seen a foreigner and never heard the name of Jesus. And their society was set up with strict holiness standard and rules. I can take you to the interior of Africa before there was uh, American and European missionaries that ever went there. And I can tell you tribes that had a very good standard of living in reference to the morals of the people. I can take you to the American Indian before white man ever sailed across on their big ugly boats. And I can tell you a society that refused to kill animals just for fun. And I can take you to an educated bunch of people that came across to these shores that killed buffalo by the thousands and ten thousands just because it was a sport. And I can take you to the original American Indians that they used to weep at the excesses of the white man that had overridden God in their hearts. But God! somehow put within every culture of this world what's right and not what's not right. I can take you to cultures that never had an outside influence and I can show you those cultures have better sense than to be flirting around and somebody else messing with their wife. In fact, in those cultures, if you mess with the man's wife, he will kill you. Hello? And so we have... We have something that happened on the day of Pentecost when God put in the man's hearts, know the Lord, and everyone will know the Lord. Whether you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, that's a different story. But everyone knows only educated people are atheists. You will never find a person who's an atheist in subcultures, in foreign cultures, every person. The Eskimos worshipped God. It may not have been the right God. It may have been a twisted form of worship to God. But they were trying to worship God. The Hindus have three, mi three million gods, or 300 million gods. They worship the monkeys, the apes, the elephants, you name it, they'll worship it. Let me tell you something. All cultures know God. No one has to say no God. I was thinking the other day, or many, many, for many years now, I've been thinking that the Muslim people, how can they ever be saved? How can they be saved? Because you can't legally preach to them. And then Justine has been doing story after story after story of the Muslims that have had supernatural encounters. And look at this. What every single one of those testimonies have in common is this. I was trying to get Allah's favor. And I tried so hard, but I, I could never seem to. I prayed five times a day to the east. Found out where east was, drew a line made a line in my room so I knew exactly how to bow and what direction to bow to pray toward Mecca. To, I needed to pray toward the east. Why do, they, why do you think they pray toward the east? Because Jesus is coming from the east. Every Muslim is praying toward the east. Well, they say, well, that's where Mecca is. Not if you're on the other side. They ought to pray to the west. Depends on where you are. But they all pray to the east. Why? Because he's coming from the east. You, you take the Muslim people that have come to Christ and they said, when I was in jail, I started calling out on God. I started seeking Allah. Oh, Allah! Why don't you talk to me? And I would have a nagging thought come to me. Why don't you try calling on Jesus? And then some of them would start praying, Oh, Jesus, if you're not just a prophet, you're really the Son of God like those foreigners say, make yourself known to me. And then he does. You know why he does? Because if you seek God, you'll find God when you search for God with all of your heart. 
And you may start out seeking God, calling on Allah. But if you call desperately enough, and if you realize that, that Allah never, you can never have favor with Him, and you, and you say, but the Koran says that, that I have favor with Allah. Allah will have, as a loving Allah. But yet everything that He does is mean and wicked. And one of the guys said, I was born and all my life I had this dark shadow. This dark shadow would be over here. I, when I would pray to Allah, I would see this dark shadow right over here. And every time I prayed to Allah, I felt fear. And I felt like I could never make Allah happy with me. And I used to tell my father, but father, there's this dark image over here that I feel good about this image over here. I, I feel like there's but I can always see it. When I start praying over to, to the east, I see someone's over here. It's just, it's like an image. It's, it's, it's not a bright light, but and one day, he said, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus. And he said he felt flooded with love. He was in confusion. For several weeks until he, someone told him the truth about Jesus. Another man went to a man and said, tell me about your religion. I'm doing a research. And he started asking him questions. And the light of God came through. Why? Because Jesus is the light that lighteth every man that comes to the world. And when Jesus Christ gave his blood, something happened. And that something was you will no longer have to say to anyone, know the Lord, for all men will know me. But until they accept him, he's not their Lord, but they know him. And I assert to you today on the day of Pentecost, that is when the new covenant was made and 3,000 people were born again. And today, I ask every person in this place, do you know the Lord as your personal Savior? That's the issue. Because you all know, somehow you know, that there is a God that hears and answers prayer. But until you know that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him, you don't really know Him. To whom to know is life eternal. So today I say this is Pentecost Sunday. You're going to think about this all day long. You're going to eat cake here and, represent, and celebrate our 37th year as being a church. But I'm asking every person today to consider that on the day of Pentecost, something more happened. A new covenant was put into the earth. A new covenant. The old covenant was taken away, nailed to the cross. A new covenant came into play when the day of Pentecost had fully come. And on that day, 120 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And from that day on, all can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray you'll take this message and burn it into the hearts of every person that's here. I thank you, Lord, that You have absolutely made a way. You've made a new covenant. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You've made a new covenant that all men not only will know you, but they will can know you personally as their Lord and Savior. All men on this earth, Lord, they have a God knowledge since the day of Pentecost, but now, Lord, you can give them a personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask today, you'll help us in our witnessing. that We won't try to keep proving that there is a God. We don't need to. For all men know there's a God. That we will just nourish the God hole 
the God-sized hole in every person that we meet. For every person in this world has something inside of them that knows that there is a God. Thank you, Lord, for opening up the way of salvation. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to this planet Earth again. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me to your, to your feet, if you will. The time is late, and I want you all to be able to go and enjoy your lunch and enjoy fellowship with each other. But I want you today, when you leave this place, to acknowledge that Jesus is your Savior. Raise your right hand. If you know that Jesus is your Savior, say, I have accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. And I'm living for Him the best I know how. This day, I make Jesus Lord of my life. Now raise your other hand and say, Lord, I'm open to being filled with your Spirit. Fill me to overflowing. You have sent the Holy Spirit to write the law of God in my heart. And I want that Holy Spirit to help me every day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. 